we don't want to keep you for too long, uh, Adolf. Um, sure. You, you know, we're going to our meeting is going to go to nine. Um, okay. You just you just let us know when you got to go. OK. How's that? Fair enough. All right, cool. Um, we'll squeeze as much as much time out of you. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we got a, a few questions that we okay. talked about and, and, and yeah. we might not get to all of them. Uh, and if we, you know, go down, if we find a, uh, an interesting path that we want to pursue, then we can right. uh, move on to that. But it would be good to get to all these questions. So everybody uh, who wrote them is, is represented. Yeah. Um, if we can, let's start with Zach. Okay, yeah. Um, so having just uh, finished Class Notes, which was, I believe, published in like 2000, right. uh, I'm kind of curious to uh, hear um, kind of in your own words, if you've had any kind of perspective changes in the last 20 years, it's kind of a lot has happened. Right, um, yeah. If you've had any further reflections on, you know, the same, uh, I know it's kind of a whole collection of things that you wrote in Class Notes, but right. uh, yeah, what what What's been going on in the last 20 years that you can reflect on? Yeah, well, that is an interesting question. Uh, I think one thing is that I was a little closer to agnostic about um, the political signif- or the political implications of, of what people now in- embrace as identity politics then. And, uh, and agnostic. Um, I mean, not agnostic in the sense that I didn't know whether it was really a bad thing, but uh, agnostic in the sense that, I mean, I remember um, you know, Walter and I were talking about this when he was working on the trouble with uh, you know, diversity, that um, in his drafts, I told him, well, I think that this is like a brilliant um, laying out of the logic that uh, um, you know, undergirds this this discourse, but I think um, just if only for rhetorical purposes, it might have been more effective um, to, I wouldn't say soften it, but to make or to leaven it, I guess, with with concessions, um, acknowledging the um, ambivalent, um, uh, the ambivalent short-term political impact of these stances, right? Uh, and um, so that, for instance, I mean, this is an illustration, like more, more than once, I'm, I'm sure in class notes, I, I, I say things like, whatever identity politics or race politics may have been 30 or 40 years ago, it's no longer that, and it's increasingly this, right? Uh, this class class program. Um, now, um, I think Walter's um, approach to argument about it in uh, the trouble with diversity then is absolutely correct and needs no modif or well, it never really needed a modification, but both because um, whatever political ambivalence there was or ambiguity there was about where uh, identity politics or of whatever sort, but, but, but especially race, uh, you know, race politics or anti-racist politics uh, uh, occupied on the ideological continuum or no matter what, how, how, how people who embraced it saw themselves politically, uh, right? The point then, as as now, was it substantively, it's aligned with the other side. Well, now, uh, as things have continued to evolve, it's only become more and more so, and more and more uh, I mean, obvious. And I say to my son, or my son and I say to each other, and like to other, other you know, comrades almost on a daily basis, that it just feels like every day, the pure class character of this politics becomes more, clear, more open, and more in your face. So that's a significant change. Um, We've lost uh, more ground, and the two are connected. We've lost more more ground on on possibilities of um, building uh, a class-based left in in the US, right? So that's worse. And I mean, you know, um, and uh, another old, uh, I mean, Labor Party comrade, 
and I were musing a couple of days ago, this is the 25th anniversary of the founding convention of the Labor Party and and the politics that 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 was bound up with runs all the way through class notes or that project was bound up with runs all the way through class notes from the dedications um, to the end, basically. Um, I'm since we shut it down, like I've I've still been operating the same way, right? I mean, um, um, I think I may have said this on the on the Bad Faith podcast that all the popular writing that I do is really, I mean, directed toward trying to connect with with people who either uh, who want to identify with, with the left or to be part of a movement uh, of a serious left uh, in the working class based movement, but who because of the sea that 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 we all have to swim in when we talk about uh, I mean movement politics, either um, haven't have have had misgivings or uneasiness that they haven't been able quite to form form into uh, language or, or ideas, or have been able to form them into language and ideas, but 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 feel, um, I wouldn't say afraid, but um, um, self, self-critical self about saying them out loud, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think I said this to Brianna when she asked me why, why, why I wasn't trying to establish common cause with the black bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. um, that uh, uh, the most gratifying uh, the responses I can get to stuff, stuff, get from stuff that I've written is is when random people write me uh, and and thank me for one of those two uh, for having helped them do one of those two things. Uh, what else has changed? Uh, I think, and well, I mean, everything that that I just said about identity politics and anti race and anti racist politics in general is like also true about uh, disparities discourse. And I don't know if you guys have encountered it, but. Um, uh, my colleague uh, Merlin Chalquanian and I did an article in the Socialist Register in 2012 uh, that uh, went after the disparities discourse as a class class politics. Um, what else? Well, uh, um, would you say uh, would you say that your pol- the policy goals that you illustrate in class notes um, have remained unchanged? Oh yeah, yeah, and I mean when. Uh, I mean, most of the leadership of the, of the Labor Party were lapsed Catholics, and we've all got this touch of of um, um, uh, not wanting to boast, basically. But when we get together, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know we remark that much of Bernie Sanders' program was our platform, right? <laughs> or or his platform was our program, and that's great, right? And that's what you want, so. And then definitely the free higher ed stuff, but a lot of it, and also I mean single payer, and a lot of it too. Uh, and 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 in fact, we were talking about this a few days ago as well. That when we look at where we are now, um, the and the best way to make sense of Trumpism, right, is that it's the product of um, not only a half century of neoliberal um, in insecuritization, basically. That, I just made that up, right? But, but, but if we're speaking German, I know it would be there already. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but also of the fact that the Democrats, or A, the Democrats are the only, um, for most people, um, conceivable alternative. Um, and they've 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 not offered them anything compelling at all. And as um, Anthony Mazaki said said often, like um, I mean, the system <clears throat> can't continue, right? Because uh, because uh, um, because inequality intensifies every year. Uh, and if we and the Democrats aren't aren't going to offer people about anything that's credible or persuasive or that actually even helps them in an appreciable way. And if we as a 
left, and it is very clear, a working class trade union based left, if we can't find a way to offer people some uh, uh, explanations that are clear and um, comprehensible and a path uh, to something better, or at least the outlines of a path to something better, as uh, and Tony used to say, there are a lot of really nasty elements out there that will have stuff stuff to offer them, right? And 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 uh, stuff that will have, <clears throat> um, you know, the quick street appeal of of internal consistency, right? Because that's what conspiracy theories do, uh, and and will um, and will and and will uh, avoid um, the. Um, expose of their own contradictions uh, through uh, from scapegoating, right? And, you know, I, I mean, that's just gotten crazier too. I mean, Dr. Seuss already and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Mr. Potato Head, I mean, mm. but it doesn't matter. And I've said this for, for a long time too, that, that the right, uh, and I got something to say about the fascism thing, thing too, if it comes up in, in an organic way. If it doesn't, just uh, you remind me later. Hmm. Um, um, but the right, th- this is what the right has always done, right? And, and one way to, to summarize all of the different variants of the way they do it or the targets that they pick, uh, and it makes sense to me because it's like so much like uh, you know, late 19th, uh, and um, early 20th um, on the Democratic Party politics in the South is to say, look, there's a nigger over there, right? And it can be an immigrant, it can be a woman who who who's can, um, who wants to preserve or practice a, a reproductive freedom. It can be uh, you know, people who want to be open about their sexual orientations. It, it can be un, undocumented workers. It could be Dr. Seuss even, right? So... Uh, and I mean, um, I guess um, you know, combining uh, the response to your question with previous one, uh, all that stuff has gotten worse in the last twenty years. And I mean, that's one of the reasons. As I said to Brianna, you know, I don't bother trying to um, accommodate um, you know the sensibilities of the McWokeyites. Because uh, you can't in the first place, but I mean, even if you could, I don't want to talk to them, right? And that's, <laughs> that's I don't I'm trying to talk to. Well, great. That's a, a good segue into my question. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> um, Dealers choice. Well, I would ask you to elaborate on. Uh, I, I thought I heard you say that um, on the the trouble with disparity article that um, Walter uh, Walter Ben Trump, Michaels Ben Michaels wrote. Yeah. Um, that you had uh, encouraged him to be so, or to sort of be, to make more concessions. Right. Right. Why, why is that? Well, because at the time, well, not, not a second, I was saying the other uh, question. Um, at the time there, the uh, naked class character of identity politics was a little more unambiguous. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, um, Right. I mean, his uh, the brilliance of that book is that he goes to the logical core of of, of the politics. Oh, is right? this is this different than your essay, The Trouble with Disparity? Oh, uh, wait, I'm lost. The the non-site article. Uh, uh, the Trouble with Disparity. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, not that that's what you were asking about. Yeah, yeah, there's a book and an article with the same name. Um, oh, yes. oh, no, yeah, no, right. Uh, um, his book was The Trouble with Diversity. Oh, gotcha. Right, right. Uh, so between The Trouble with uh, Diversity and The Trouble with, with Disparity, uh, the world had, had, had changed enough now that, the, that, that it's no longer reasonable to assume that there are some genuinely left inclined people out there who buy buy the anti-racism stuff just if if for no other reason than because of fumes fumes from the 60s and 70s right mm. that, that that are still in the air um uh, now um you know that ambiguity has been resolved and 
And look, I mean, I, I think uh, from the perspective of an historical materialist historiography, um, the way to um, understand that is that um, you know, the forces that were in, impelling in, in that direction 15 years ago, wow, it is 15 years, uh, <laughs> have become that much more hegemonic uh, and cohorts of young people have emerged into adult life thinking that shit is real. Like thinking, for instance, that the purpose of the 13th Amendment was, was to continue slavery by, by, by surreptitious means, right? And all other kind of crazy shit like that. Right? Mm. Uh, and I mean, the incentives have, have changed. I mean, I've, I think we both, uh, I, I both have uh, you mentioned this in, in a number of places, but um, I've lately been uh, referring to um, the corporate tsunami of, of anti-racist pieties and anti-racist monies after uh, the George Floyd murder as like the, as like the equivalent of our bourgeoisie's um, um, Operation Barbarossa, right? Like, uh, I, I mean, the German invasion of the Soviet Union because they just swept across the plains, and 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 I know part of part of what they were going for is, and I mean, we were working in South Carolina till we couldn't, and we continued working down there uh, remotely, and we're still working down there, mm. right? I mean, even though we haven't been able to get in, or those from outside haven't been able to get into the state, but. Um, but I, I've made certain not to lose sight of the fact and try to encourage other people not to, that um, when the pandemic began, uh, we, we were um, in a position of being, being able, you know, both uh, to simultaneously um, act on and celebrate um, the groundwork that Sanders campaign did for us, right? Uh, because we had in uh, New Medicare for All, we had an issue um, that was rooted in in uh, communities um, beyond the campaign, right? And, and I mean beyond the primaries, and around the country there was stuff that we could go back and build on. And I I felt that. Um, like you don't need to have a half dozen guys in a back room with a lot of, I mean, cigar smoke, plotting together, but the, but but there was a collective common sense um, that emerged among that that stratum that the combination of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter moment was like a propitious opportunity um, to try to change uh, you know to change the subject, and I'm still hopeful. I mean. Um, uh, uh, the Medicare for All movement isn't going anywhere nope. now, and it's not going anywhere. Ironically, partly because Biden won, um, <laughs> we are getting stuff out of Biden though, and and it's not just chopped liver stuff that's important. So, hmm. so, so I think for those of us who um, followed the warrant, that sometimes you just have to clean the damn toilet and and vote for the Democrat. Um, I mean, I think it's already um, uh, uh, the votes are already justified. Now we'll see what happens as we go down the road. But that makes me feel better. Than I <laughs> oh well, good, good. Well, I, I mean, as everybody knows, I'm a Pollyanna. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, I, I think I, I think you answered my question really well. Oh, oh okay, good. The next okay. one, Sarah. Okay, um, I'm just gonna uh, read my question. Okay, <laughs> sure. Right. Um, so in, in light of your assertions- Oh, about oh I'm the, sorry, but um, oh, what's your post back in, just the curiosity? Oh, um, condensed matter theory in ah, physics. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, yeah, so in light of your assertions about the importance of labor organizing detailed in class notes, mm -hmm. what specific advice would you give to people like us 
people working within this precarious individuated economy right. with little to no opportunity to join a union or form one? How do we get involved in the movement for this working class agenda? Yeah, well, no, that's a great, great question. And I've been getting it a fair amount lately, and I should be getting it a fair amount lately, or period. And and it's a really hopeful question, because there are a lot of people like that out there. Um, and um, I really don't have a good answer, right? I mean, um, so um, I'll give you kind of a roundabout one, maybe. Um, for very, um, very kind of quirky reasons. Um, I got closely involved. I have been closely involved with, um, what, what we would have called back in an earlier time, the healthy elements within the Philly DSA chapter. Right. Uh, and, um, some of them were grad students. Um, some of them, uh, were people who had finished, like one of them who comes to mind is a woman who's a musician. She did uh, she did a master's in social work at Bryn Mawr. She's working in an agency. Um, uh, some of them are still grad students. Some of them are my, I mean, dissertation advisors, but I mean, that's, you know, I'm not responsible for their being affiliated with DSA. Um, but but at the level of, you know, kind of sitting around the bar talking and thinking about, um, you know, what to do and how to be, be, be effective. Um, the woman, uh, the, the woman with the MSW actually, <clears throat> um, went, went to work as a salt at the Philadelphia airport for Unite Here. Um, and, as a what? and, uh, pardon me? As a what? What oh, um, as a salt, as a, as a, as a, um, someone that the union sends sends into a, a workplace, uh, I mean to organize it, ah. right? Uh, but she wasn't on on staff, and she had to live on the wages, um, and you got to live on the wages that you get paid, basically. Mm. And then um, you know later she went on to um, a different union staff. Uh, she wound up actually, I don't know, some of you might have encountered her. Um, she wound up um, eventually as a, as a, the national coordinator for labor for Bernie, um, and then left at the uh, up on at the campaign was over. I mean, so there are things like that that people can do. Um, um, I mean, I just realized this now. There was this John Berger film that came out in 1975 called. Jonah, uh, it, it was in French, but called Jonah who'll be 25 in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And it was about a group of people who were veterans of the May events in 68 uh, and had gotten, you know, dispersed right after, you know, that defeat basically. And were trying to figure out what their lives were going to be and what they were doing it, right. I mean, going forward. And this is a similar moment. It's not brought on by a political defeat. It's brought on by capitalism doing what capitalism does, right? Uh, um, so maybe the first thing to do would, would be to read Braverman's uh, Let Labor Monopoly Capital, which, uh, which I think is always a great thing. But so, I mean, to look for, I mean, opportunities like that, I mean, frank, frankly, I think, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up anybody's ass, but I think um, projects like, the project that you guys have now, right? The reading group is kind of a start of something, right? Um, um, I had a long exchange with, with a kind of bookish intellectual friend of mine who's a leftist, uh, I mean, this morning, um, uh, about this kind of question that, that, that the, um, so you probably know, and this is where I might say something about the fascism, many fascism stuff, uh, I mean, you probably know that there's like a bigger or smaller tendency, maybe a couple of them, right? But a, um, a smaller epicycle and a bigger tendency um, in segments of the left now to consider the possibility of a brown, 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 red alliance, right? Um, in between um, the, uh, in fact, like sh shortly before, like, like between the Q and honors and the right. communists. Okay. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 
And when that shit has uh, been been tried in the past, it hasn't worked out all that well for our side. Mm. Uh, and to wit, uh, I just uh, not not long before I got on the Zoom, um, um, I saw an article maybe on uh, you know, Alternet or Common Dreams about like a a mass killing of labor organizers and communists in the Philippines um, because uh, you know Duterte said, okay, it's time. It's time to resolve this shit forever. And I sent it to a bunch of friends and said, uh, so maybe you want to pass this on to, to anybody whom you know who's gotten curious about the possibility of the brown-green or the brown-red alliance. Um, but, but the real point here is that people are looking for big answers, right? Uh, and big, big answers and immediatist uh, approaches, right? A lot of that is because, uh, or I think it's more current uh, among academics who sort of parse reified abstract concepts for a living, right? Uh, and the social scientists in particular who, 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 um, whose approach to life is, um, Fetishistically taxonomic, right? I mean, so, so I mean, what? Sorry. Fetishistically taxonomic, right? I mean, like, yeah, right. So, in the sense that, uh, I mean, you guys even, pardon me, have probably lived through some debates about what qualifies as ne neoliberalism and what doesn't, hmm. right? And like, this shit's been going on uh, for 25 years. And it can't go any place because the only answer can be it depends because it's a reified abstract category, right? And it doesn't really matter. No, <laughs> not at all. It 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 absolutely doesn't matter. And that's what's been happening now with um, you know the authoritarian populism debate and the um, fascism. You know, is was that pack of motherfuckers who perpetrated and an insurrection because that because I'm hanging on to that uh, at the Capitol were do, do they count as fascist or not and I can take about <clears throat> 25 seconds of that maybe I mean that long if it comes from the guy uh, you know standing out in front of the liquor store with a shopping cart wearing everything he owns right less if it comes from somebody with a PhD. Right. I mean, I was saying, who gives a fuck? That's not the point. Right. Um, so one thing you can do is not that, you know what I mean? I mean, right. Uh, and I mean, that's an important thing to do, because I realized when I was writing to my friend today um, that part of the appeal of that, I and mean, like I said, it's partly because that's what uh, I mean, social scientists do. Uh, and I mean, I'm. I've, I've, I've had the luxury, right, for going on 35 years now uh, to, of having no further uh, material pressure and thus, in part, I mean, therefore, no conceptual pressure uh, to pay any attention to what they do or say at all, um, except where something might seem to catch my eye and to be... I mean, or to be helpful or to appeal to some um, idiosyncratic um, uh, uh, intellectual interest I have, like hominid evolution, for instance. But, but, um, but, but, the, but one of, but another reason that it appeals, well, it also appeals, um, I mean, that, that, that kind of big architectonic um, you know, debate Right. Um, of course, appeals to people who went to really fancy colleges. Right. But it also appeals to people who work in the media because those are or like in podcasts or left journalism or whatever, uh, because those industries um, live in symbiotic, if not parasitic, uh, in the relationship to the boundaries of mainstream bourgeois political discourse, mm. right? Um, <clears throat> so you, you can understand that and make allowances for it, right? 
um, because I've never um, told told anybody they shouldn't eat. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes you got to do that. But but you also seems to me you've got an obligation to be aware what you're doing to eat, right? And it's not that you need uh, you know to walk around uh, flagellating yourself about it, right? It's just but but you have to know that there is there are some positions I can't take. There 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 are some um, stances I can't pursue because I'm constrained by, by my uh, I mean, material circumstances. Huh. Um, so it's not like a moral thing, right? And, and, and I guess, you know, I don't know if this came through uh, in, in the stuff of mine that, that you guys have read, but, but where I think we are and have been for a while, and I mean, this may, may be um, you know, unacceptably dogmatic seeming, but you can't build a movement to transform capitalism uh, without a disciplined ideological party, right? And that's just kind of the way it is. Uh, and so Lenin, so read yeah, that. yeah, right, exactly. And 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 everything else is just kind of bullshit. But there are a lot of ways to do it, right? I mean, there are different ways to do it. And and I've never been one like to fetishize um, on what happened in 1917, right? Huh. But we need to have something like that. Uh, I'm a little more likely to fetishize. Gramsci and Lukash, but you don't need what to. The, what about the IWW? Uh, well, see, I think it was a self-limiting project that that was that had a certain kind of power at a particular moment, right? Uh, um, and um, and 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 I mean, ironic. Well, interestingly, I mean that that moment was before the full consolidation of the national state. Right. Hmm. Um, right. And uh, and I mean, that also takes me back for 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 a pirouette right on the Capitol in, uh, insurrection again, <clears throat> because I've been saying to people lately, well, look, yes, it was pathetic and. Um, and sad in, in uh, you know, some ways, but it was also dangerous. Hmm. Right. Uh, and the fact that it was pathetic. Um, doesn't mean it was harmless or insignificant, right? Uh, the beer hall push in 1923 was pathetic. Mm. And, and it was pathetic p- partly because it, it uh, reflected um, um, an obsolete 19th century understanding of how you see, seize power, mm. right? Um, and... and and that made like uh, the thing of the capital even sadder and dumber, mm. right? But it was still dangerous. And I've been saying to people who, and and I'm kind of appalled that there are so many people on the left who, who take their 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 cues from uh, a fund or or whose fundamental commitment is to um, um, epate, uh, right? I mean, both the bourgeoisie. And and the woke left. So whatever the former say, they got to go over to the opposite pole. Uh, and, and that's not a politics. That's like um, I mean, some dumb dumb shit. But hmm. but um, but anyway, uh, that was like a double pirouette. <laughs> great. Sorry. No, great. Um, can 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 we get, uh, ask you one more question? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, you can, yeah. I mean, I can stay. What well, I can stay until nine. Hey, all right. Okay. Um, Gabriel, go. Thank you. Uh, I have my question written out, so it's kind of long. Um, so it goes, in the essay, Ethnic Studies and Pluralist Politics, you right. see a historicized and pluralist perspective on education. You write, Moby Dick is a different, richer text when read through a lens sensitive to the significance of race in mid-19th century social thought. I attend St. John's College, which teaches the great books curriculum. We right. are invited by tutors to focus exclusively on the content of the text rather than its historical context. For right. instance, if you read Aristotle, we won't discuss through like the land of it being in a slave society. So I was wondering like how, what you would think of that method of- Right, well, uh, I'll say two things. Um, my mother was um, a developmental college in, in instruction teacher her entire career, right? And she was um, 
a strong uh, I'm advocate of great books, of the great books approach. <clears throat> um, and so I, you know, did enough of that on my own, right? Um, I'm, I'm just a dyed in the wool hit, uh, historicist contextualist. And, um, and, and obviously one can read the text any way one wants to read it. Um, but, but actually, um, I mean, I don't know, like if you would appreciate this, uh, you know, the great books orientation, but uh, in my book on, uh, on uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's of um, uh, the political thought and shout out to Great Barrington, um, begins and ends with an argument um, for, um, for an historical um, the contextualist um, reading. And also, like, like there's another book that my friend Kenneth Warren and I put together called uh, Reflections on um, Black Intellectual History. Uh, that's a collection of like 10, uh, 10 articles, three, three by lit scholars, three by historians, and three, three by political scientists. That is another one in there somewhere. Um, that's that that's actually in, intended to be a substantive an argument for the power of of of, of historicist and of the contextualist readings. I mean, um, where can and, we find that list? Uh, pardon me. Where can we find that list? Uh, oh, uh, oh, the. Um, I mean, uh, maybe I'm just I mean, coming in. I'm sorry. Never mind. Uh, oh yeah, no, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, you can find a book on Amazon. Right. Um, yeah, I mean they're both on Amazon. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about prices, but but I tell you what, though, you know, I think do, no, yeah, I'm not sure. Like I thought I might have had a PDF of the Du Bois book, which I would send you. Oh. Well, I'll find out if I do. I will, uh, and and I'll ask. <clears throat> like when I left 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 Penn, like I left. <clears throat> uh, I'm still advising five, I mean, doctoral students, and maybe I can ask one of them um, to do a PDF for new and black. I misunderstood. I thought you were saying that you guys had compiled. A, oh, a, no, no, no. Uh -uh. Books, and I, I just wanted the list. Oh, for us. oh OK. Sorry. sorry. We'll, 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 yeah. Sorry about that. Continue what you were saying. Yeah. Um, so, I mean. And I guess I'm just such, you know, a kind of old fashioned 1920s Marxist that the idea that ideas have meaning outside of a given context uh, just doesn't sit, 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 sit well with my work practice even. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, but I recall that question because it made me think of my mother right when the great book stuff. Cool. Um, and uh, by the way, look, I mean, don't get me wrong, like it can be useful, right? I mean, she found it very I mean, useful in teaching um, conceptual thinking and uh, logic, right? Um, to what are basically uh, um, re uh, um, re remedial college students, right? So um, it's very helpful. Cool. George. Yeah, uh, Professor, I think I heard mentioned, uh, you mentioned in a podcast you were making some activist work regarding uh, Venezuela or other Latin American country. I'm not quite sure, but my question is like in general, just what do you think like at this moment of the experiences of the pink tide governments? Mm -hmm. And to contextualize more like, uh, I've been reading two of your essays, one in class notes, which is uh, pimping poverty then and now. Okay. And the other is uh, yeah. that that got me a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other is Vietnam to Venezuela, U.S. interventionist right. and the failure of the left. Right. And uh, like I, I agree. Like not only like leftists or academics or in the U.S. but also in Latin America in itself. Like they are just moralized no class no class right. uh, analysis no political just pure human rights discourse right 
And like reading your other article about pimping poverty, like uh, made me make a clear like image of how maybe even the, I can conceptualize like the pink tie experience, like old school uh, poverty pimps versus neoliberal imperialist poverty pimps. Right. Right. That are like supported by the US, like NGOs and grants, and uh, right. versus like a more organic, because given the constraints of capitalist, liberal democracy, and so on, mm -hmm. there is no organized party in Latin American countries, right? And it's very, it's very improbable that it happens soon. Like, and even when the basis of like my, my own go a part in uh, here in Bolivia, like the mass, it's, there are bases, right? Yeah. But it's not right. a cadre. It's a not. It's not a cadre. Uh, oh really? Party, right. It's it's well. It, it is partly that. It is partly patronage networks. Mm -hmm. Like and like and okay. like you mentioned in the essay of poverty people. Like it works like that in many ways. Like they mm -hmm. just a lot of corruption, which is because there is no, yeah, just corruption. Old school. Right. Uh, just people who opportunists who take. Uh, grants from the government and then they just use it for themselves and so on. So um, yeah. just question is like, what, what do you think of like the experience right now and the, the current dilemma? Because I agree with you, it's, at this point it's a zero sum game. Like I, I support the mass mm -hmm. for Venezuela because I think like, in, otherwise like all the experience is going to be lost. For, uh, like, right. when, yeah. So, yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, well, I mean, I'll say one thing, and like this is like expressing a bit of peak, but I always do it uh, because I lived for so long with so many segments of even the nominally radical left, right? I mean, not just the church basement people and stuff. Um, um, and Bernie did this too, casually, um, 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 you know, disparaging Cuba and Venezuela as dictatorships, right? But even people uh, farther to Bernie's left or, or who imagined themselves to be farther um, you know, to Bernie's left, who um, you know, did that about Venezuela, both when Chavez was alive and then under Maduro. And, uh, and I mean, the, if you understand the balance of class forces in uh, Venezuelan politics, right? It was clear, right? It was clear from 2004, if not earlier, that the only way that the PSUV could remain in power to try to build anything at all like socialism or even like the PT, right? To expand, uh, I mean, the welfare state, uh, you know, to cover people, uh, you know, to cover everyone who need, needed to be covered. The only way they, they could do that was because Chavez had maintained uh, the relationships with, with buddies of his, like in the army, you know, the cronies, right? Uh, and yeah, there's some cronyism, right? There's gonna be some cronyism uh, because um, people aren't perfect and people came up like in the old society and you know, whatever. But even in the new one, there's gonna be some, some kinds of cronyism or something like that. Um, but uh, un until the MAS um, was restored to power uh, and, what, and whatever the new regime in, in Ecuador looks like it's going to be, um, the PSUV in Venezuela was the only one of the pink tide governments that, that remained in power. And what kept them there was both the cadre organization of the party and the fact that uh, Chavismo had neutralized the military, right? Uh, and I mean, a lot of, you know, Northern world, I mean, leftists, what used to be called first world leftists, who, who, who as I'm sure you know, um, want um, the, the, the more brutally uh, oppressed and exploited uh, people on the periphery of the capitalist world, um, you know, to take the big hits for them. For instance, Greece, right? Um, where, where, like all those leftists, you know, were going around um, and, uh, you know, denouncing Cyprus and Syriza because they wouldn't leave, leave the Eurozone, 
right? Now, I mean, not only had they committed publicly um, that that they wouldn't leave the Eurozone if, if they were elected and, and that became the government, and they made that public commitment because the electorate didn't want to leave the Eurozone because people were afraid about what would happen if you pulled out and it went back to the drachma. I mean, things would have been horrible, right? But um, radical left leftists, both you know, sectarians, any flavor of Trotsky, as you can imagine, but also like um, you know, the pious, purist left, um, you know, left intellectuals um, thought that this was the worst sellout possible and they had an obligation like, uh, I mean, to leave the Eurozone. <clears throat> and you wanna say, well, take France out of the fucking Eurozone and if you want somebody to get out of the Eurozone so bad to make it collapse, right? Uh, um, tell Macron, right? Uh, we 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 need to go back to the Frank, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I've um, and I mean, like a lot of people, and I guess this is something else we could add to your uh, um, original question about uh, things that have changed. You know, but uh, um, it wasn't that long. Well, really, around the time that that class notes actually came out as a book. Um, a lot of us were getting pretty enthusiastic about, um, you know, the emergence of the pink tide. And I think um, I, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Brazil and I'm pretty closely, I mean, connected to, to people with, with, with the Pete and the Kut, good friends. And I mean, it, it was clear that, and I mean, by the way, I, I think you know too that a lot of North American leftists Always turn turn their nose up, uh, turned up their no noses at both those those governments, both the Pete government and the PSUV. Um, but um, but it's pretty clear that there was like a a race going on, and that was that the the uh, um, the Chavistas and the Pete both were operating on a wager that they hoped that if they could keep broadening the social state and the benefit structure to cover more and more poor people and, and the working class, that you'd eventually get to a point where the bourgeois parties would never be able to win, um, win control of the government again, right? right? And of course, I mean, they weren't stupid. Like, um, I mean, they knew that, that, the, bourgeois, uh, that the bourgeoisie knew what was going on, right? Um, and in both cases, what what happened, and it happened in, in uh, near Bolivia too, like in a different way, what was that? Um, you know, the ruling, or the old ruling class um, came to recognize, and there was like a US coordination around this too. It's like a replay of Operation Condor, right? Right, right, like the US. Yes. Um, uh, you know, under both Obama and uh, Trump, was meeting with with uh, with uh, the right wing elements uh, from all those countries, uh, and they all said, "Look, like we're coming dangerously close to a point at which uh, we aren't going to be able." Uh, you know, the idea that that we could win control of the government is unthinkable, right? Uh, um, so, so we got to do something, and as we know uh, the something that they had to do was to demonstrate what we've known all along, that they have no commitment to formal democracy, right? Uh, it's, they tolerate it okay. as long as it doesn't challenge class rule, right? Mm -hmm. So in every case, like they've moved against the governments. And, and in fact, um, my, close, uh, my closest uh, friend, friend, friend in Brazil, um, who was a trade unionist here too. Uh, and I have been talking about a project like a few months ago, we were chatting one day and, and he said, you know, this, this, this cycle of winning social democratic re reforms through, through the electoral realm and gaining um, enough uh, that the bourgeoisie comes, come, comes and destroys it all through 
through a violent coup. And he says, this is a cycle that can go on until the sun burns out. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we're, we've been talking about writing something about that uh, and partly, and it's gotta be delicate, right? Because even our, our allies on the left um, don't, don't like the sound of, 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 um, of, um, of, um, debunking, if not um, actively, uh, I mean, disparaging, uh, you know, they're hollowed, uh, I mean, democratic institutions, right? Uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, like, did that uh, um, get to your question? Yeah, I mean, it touched the many, many things regarding my question, and like, there is this basic, like, like I said, contradiction, like, the the, this left social democratic parties win power. Mm-hmm. They help, they help uh, people come out, like have more money, and right. more, and then they can be more easily swayed to the right. Right. And, yeah. yep. and the bright power then Germany. Yep. The, the, the cycle can repeat itself, and um, and like what I am like questioning is like it's difficult to get out because like people. Like because of the liberal liberal democratic the constraints that the liberal democratic state has, right? right. Yeah. Well, no, that's right. That's right. And, well, and look, um, um, a lot of my family is in Cuba. A big chunk of my family came 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 from Cuba, so I've seen a path, right? And there is one, right? <laughs> um, but that was under very particular circumstances, like the route. It is is going to be different, but uh, but fact is, it, you know, and like this is what I meant about the need to be delicate because I can't go because it doesn't make sense to go out and like broadcast this on a podcast or whatever. But the fact is, you can't have socialism unless you liquidate the bourgeoisie, and I mean that doesn't mean you know shoot them and toss them into a ditch, but 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 it means you've got to make 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 certain that they can't take power. Um, a number of years ago, I was in Havana. I was talking to a friend of mine who's um, a party functionary there, and it was during a period at the at the end of the '90s, early 2000s, when when um, when when the government had permitted um, foreign employers um, to. Uh, not to pay higher salaries, right? Because, and I don't want to go too much in the weeds here, so I'll try to be quick. But the way that 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 the hiring system went was that the foreign firm that was co-oping with the Cuban government would would pay wages to the government in 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 pesos. Oh no, in dollars. The government would pay the workers in pesos. Now, one of the arguments uh, about this, the criticisms about this from outside was that the government was basically skimming the dollars from the workers, right? And that's certainly, uh, I mean, the whole thing was partly um, a mechanism to acquire foreign exchange, um, but the government was mainly concerned with putting a lid on the development of economic inequality, right? I mean, you'd let some, happen, but that's not what the Cuban party and government's vision of a socialist society is. So, so they permitted uh, firms to top up the tank, as it were, w- for the Cuban employees, like a few extra dollars a, a month, I'm talking about 30 or 40, or a house or a car or something, right? A modest house or, or a company car. Uh, but this population was growing at that point. Um, in fact, two of my three closest cousins were actually doing that kind of work, right? So I asked my friend, uh, uh, my, uh, my friend Mendoza, because uh, at that point, I think there were 7,000 such, such workers in the country, there are probably a lot, lot more now. And I asked them, like, if they were concerned, if the government was concerned about the possibility that these people could 
could congeal as a class and cause problems, right? Uh, uh, um, I mean, politically. And 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 he said, no, I'm absolutely not. Like he didn't even take a breath first. So so I asked, well, um, um, how can you be so so certain of that? And he said, because they will never be permitted to express themselves politically as a class. So that's a different model of democracy, right? Uh, I mean, the votes are real. I mean, the votes aren't, um, you know, stooge votes like the Americans say. Um, but just as there's no place for a pedophile party, except maybe some branches of the Republican Party in in the U.S., there's there's no place for a, a property party, right, or a class based party in 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 Cuba, right? Yeah. Uh, but but that's what becomes human rights violations because the whole uh, the whole human rights thing i think you uh, i mean you at least implied this earlier is is like like whenever i hear complaints about human rights someplace what i think about is the british marching through africa in the late 19th century to stamp out the slave trade and oh by the way pick up an empire right i mean uh Sorry, like I've gone on again, but and you know, um, as an academic, I have to confess, right? Like you've got a tendency when somebody asks you what time it is to give them a lecture on how to make a watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think that's great. Um, you've given us a lot. I really, we really appreciate your time. And, and oh well, no, look, I'm happy to do it. And and to be honest, I mean, it's, I mean, I didn't know anything about this until you wrote me, obviously, but. But I'm finding this really encouraging to know that there are little cells of people out there like that because, because um, it, with, with respect to the actual political struggles uh, that present themselves for us to, to engage in, there's nothing really on the left, right? I mean, there's nothing we can do as a left except tail, tail, tail behind liberals or or tail tail behind worse, and we all do that. We all have to do it to some extent. I'm I'm on the edges of a congressional campaign now. That's what uh, what my earlier meeting was. Um, it's a candidate here. It's like hack one versus hack two, but hack two has decided that she's at a point in her career where she wants to make her key issue Medicare for all. So uh, trying to help her out. And when I've talked to comrades about it, who who asked, do you think she'll sell us out? I said, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, the only question is when and how long it will take, but, but, but if we could say, like if you think about this as like the positional struggle, and, and again, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm obviously not opposed to elections. Um, I just don't think that that's the way you build a movement. Mm. But, but if we could, could say, that we got Karen Carter, or, or that Karen Carter Peterson won this um, special election um, against Cedric Richmond's handpicked successor, and with an endorsement from Hakeem Jeffries and James, James, James Clyburn, who, when Clyburn, and, and that helps us in South Carolina, but who, when Clyburn in, endorsed, um, finally endorsed Biden. Uh, for the South Carolina primary said, as far as he was concerned, the race was between Biden and Medicare for all. If we can point to that, then that's a little, that, that's a step that, that, that we've taken, right? But anyway, why did I mention that? Uh, da, 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 elections. Um, uh, the, the little cells like this are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, this is where the movement building work is going to come from, right? Because I've already outed myself as uh, a no, no, no party, no movement guy, right? Um, as and, somebody who's architected multiple parties, it's interesting. To <laughs> <say that. laughs> uh, but, 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 but it's also that, that there's a um, um, parallel idealism out there, 
right? Like there's some shit going on now. I mean, um, what do they call it? Like the People's Party, whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Right, like a press conference in It seems to be entirely based off of just media stuff, though. Yeah, that's right. Right, right. Jesse Ventura is in it, so, I mean. Is he seriously? I thought so. Wow, okay. Well, no, I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) Wasn't Nina Turner involved? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, she is. Yep, yep. Uh, So, I mean, that's not the way to build a party, right? And there's really, like, the only way to build a party is, like, the stuff that you guys are doing. Well, I mean, like I said, like, all the all the popular writing that I do is, like, directed toward identifying potential cadre out there, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, since we, since, uh, since we, put the labor party to sleep. I'm like a snake that got its head cut off and I'm still twitching by mm-hmm. the same, I mean, reflexes 25 years later, right? Because it seems to me that that's still the task. And, 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 and the institution that we created then w- was appropriate for the task. Yeah. It's, it, it's not anymore for a lot of reasons, yeah. but the task is still the task, right? And, and and I had a little bit of this moment with uh, with uh, Nibriana, but but I get it a lot where people would say, well, but 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 this kind of slow 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 cooker uh, I mean, kind of organizing that you advocate takes a long time, and I say, yeah, it takes a long time. And then people will say, but the perils are too great for us to engage in a project like that. I mean, to which I say, well, the, one of the reasons that the perils are so great is you motherfuckers didn't <laughs> do this 30 years ago. Start earlier. Right? So, and, what, and what's the alternative? There's it, not. No, that's that. And the alternative is wish fulfillment. Yeah. And like the more uh, and the older and the crankier that I get, like the more I go back to my father's um, cohort and just just call all that stuff dilettantism. Right? Well, I mean, well, I'll tell, I'll say, uh, uh, I'll, I really agree with you. Appreciate that. And, um, I, uh, I'll say this and then we'll close out the meeting cause we've gone over and I can see, okay, people, sorry. I can see people falling asleep over there. Uh, but it's really encouraging. This, this group is really, really encouraging to me because a lot of us, um, a lot of this organizing came through on the internet and that's amazing usually on the internet discourse on the internet is, is poison is inherently right. poisoned. Right. And, and so right. to be able to to meet people from the Internet and right. bring them into a somewhat real world space and right. have a productive conversation. That's that's truly extraordinary. And I assume that that I mean, you guys have done it slowly and carefully, too. I mean, not really, <laughs> not really carefully, oh, but, okay. but slowly. There's, an, there's like a, a natural process of attrition, which uh-huh. is not right. not necessarily deliberate. But Every I would so say often I have to go. Invite people because we've lost half of our oh. group. You know, oh yeah, yeah. Fall off. And- well, um, I mean, I tell you, what's an interesting thing to read too. Um, Jane McAlevey's book, "No No Shortcuts." Uh, she's um, a longtime trade union organizer. Um, I mean, um, uh, she and I got together in the late '90s, actually, as part of. It, in a in a um, a wall to wall um, I mean organizing project in Stamford Connecticut um, and that that morphed uh, I'm into um, an anti hope six uh, uh, housing project um, fight and 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 as far as either of us knows like it's the only successful um, effort to block a hope six um, that demolition and you know mixed income blah 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 project in history and what made it successful was that housing is so expensive in Stanford that public sector workers uh, and union workers lived in public housing Mm. and we had a base of people in the housing projects who had capacity and 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 uh, and um, who could organize but what Jane does in this book is she hangs a lot on the distinction between what she calls mobilizing and 
organizing. And I mean, the former is basically getting people who, 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 uh, who already organized to do something. Uh, and that's what most activists, even in the labor movement, right? Um, uh, outside the shop context, that's what they're doing when they think they're organizing. Mm. And, and, and that's what the entire left mm. is doing when they think they're organizing. Uh, and, and if we can't break that and like this, I guess we, this can be maybe the last thing I say, but, cool, cool. but, but the gospel I've been preaching for a while now, a few months, year, two, based on what's happening around the world, um, even before Trump, but that we, or at least once Trump, Trump got elected, that it's increasingly looking like we're getting to a point at which ne neoliberalism, uh, um, the, is no longer capable of delivering enough stuff to enough of the population to be able to sustain itself as a nominally yes. de de democratic order. And if that's the case, there are only two directions we can go. Yep. And one is authoritarianism, and the other is in some way toward, toward a social democratic um, vision. And I mean, to that extent, like we at the Depp Center Douglas Institute now are thinking more and more about um, the centrality or, or the, one of the central problems is after a half century of disparagement of government, People, you know, not only have contempt for the idea of government, but but can't imagine even the notion of a public, yep. right? And mm -hmm. and the public good. And part of our political work uh, has to be trying to re rebuild or reanimate. I mean, that sense. Um, and I mean, so uh, so I'll give you a tease. Uh, um, uh, I mean, Walter and I are working on a on a piece for that site that's also going to be in a little book oh. that that uh, that we're putting together. Uh, the title of which is "There's No Such Thing as Right Wing Populism," right? Because uh, what what gets called right wing populism is really what capitalists have been doing since through the social sciences, largely since since, since the end of World War II which is re reinventing class as a notion that that has its foundations in culture, Boom. not not in political economy. So it's a different kind of identity mm -hmm. politics. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Great. Uh, well, we usually end with a, a little thing called reinforcement, um, uh, where every uh, everybody just uh, it, one at a time says name something positive from the meeting to uh to leave it on a uh, on a positive note would you like to join us for that adolf sure sure okay great uh, i'll start with adam um yeah uh thanks again i, I want to reinforce uh hmm, um reinforce uh uh you coming here and after we we've, we've, we've continued this project and we continue to read uh, reinforce the idea of you coming back to check in on us in, in a year or so, and mm. we can have another conversation. Oh yeah, and I'd love to do it. Yeah, and and it has been uh, reinforcing the idea that this has been slow and careful work, figuring out uh, how like the best formats, um, just ha how to like parse time within it. It's been like a gradual thing that that is getting smoother and more streamlined. So mm -hmm. it's a valuable project for sure. Um, Zach. Okay, cool. Uh, I want to reinforce thinking about, I mean, I actually think thought a lot, we went through a lot of things just in a few questions, uh, but uh, kind of thinking about, um, gosh, that bit, you know, just thinking about, Leo, when you're talking about neoliberalism at the end there, kind of reaching the end of, uh, kind of the end of a rope and kind of at a crossroads. Um, I'm going to reinforce more thinking about that, which I, I have been, but will be doing more of. Uh, Gabriel? Thank you. Uh, I want to reinforce meeting Adolf Reed with the fire. Yay! 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your input in the in the discourse. And this really helped me like think about a lot of stuff that I have been thinking about and, you know, put it in greater clarity. So I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I'll pass it on to Patrick. I reinforce uh, real meeting real people in real places uh, uh, and and having actual conversations and not, um, you know, whatever arm wrestling matches are happening on Facebook and <laughs> here, here. I reinforce real people. Yeah. Sarah. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, I, um, gosh, but yeah, there's a lot of, of really good stuff that we covered. Um, I think maybe the thing that's kind of like really sticking with me right now is um, this distinction between organizing and mobilization and sort of learning how to, how to, you know, get people to actually do stuff with you. Um, yeah, that's, that's my, my, I, I reinforce mobilization. Um, cool. uh, George. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess I reinforce just, uh, yeah, like not uh, compromising and like being very uh, rigorous theoretically, which is like I, I really enjoyed about class notes. I can. Oh, oh thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, pass to Jamie. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, I was delighted to have been here and. Uh, and that the, that the conversation was as informal as it was is is lovely cool. um, and um, catalytic got me thinking of, of like the residue of trumpism with when he ran his, his theme song was uh, um, but you can't always get what you want you get what <laughs> you need and I'm thinking about that that maybe we did get more than more of what we need than we figured. Mm. Um, and um, it's just great, great to have this dialogue and I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing other dialogues like this and your return. Thank you. Excellent, oh no, thank you very much. This is great for me. I mean, yeah, so should I go? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I reinforce having found out about you guys having been invited and, and being able to work it out. This is really, um, I, I mean, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass about this either. I mean, this is like the kind of thing that I live for, right? It can happen in a shop, right? It can happen across the internet, right? But it's like a cadre building process and I can see it out there. It's organic. And, um, you know, um, yeah, thank you for, for um, having me. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the questions and the discussion too. Nice. Who didn't go? Carrie? Yeah, uh, I want to reinforce, uh, you know, hopefully someday maybe, you know, talk about meeting real people, you know, it'd be great to be able to do this uh, in person, at least some yeah. of us uh, someday. Yeah. So I'll reinforce that to uh, to better days, healthier days. Um, shoot it over to uh, Justin. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to reinforce just um, earlier on in the discussion, uh, Professor Reed said that, uh, he didn't have a good answer to the question that was asked of him. And I just want to reinforce that in political organizers, to be honest and like in that way and to be upfront when you don't have an answer to something. Cause I think that's a good way to like build the organic understanding and uh, like what you called cadre building, which I th is an interesting term. I'd like to look in more. So reinforce all that and pass to Matt. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like what other people said, I'll also mirror that. Um, I'll reinforce, you know, as somebody who found this from the internet, you know, trying to precipitate some real discussion off of, um, you know, internet discourse, which I think is really cool. So that'll be my reinforcement. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. That's great. Isn't it? And uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Reed. Really. Oh yeah. And look, all you guys, right. I mean, stay in touch. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know how to get in touch with me and, 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 and if anybody wants to write and, and exchange, um, ideas and comments about stuff. Um, I feel free. Is it okay if I give them your, your, oh, your yeah, yeah. Email? yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Thus has concluded our, uh, our first two hour long meeting.
Oh God, sorry. No, no, no. no I apologize. Great. Well worth it. We'll have other guests and other two-hour-long meetings in the future. Good. All right. Next week, oh, uh, uh, the, the, the president or King's the grandson or son or whatever. All right, guys. Hey. All right. Well, let me thanks, and I look forward to uh, you being in touch. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank everyone. All right, he's All right, gone. Nice everyone. work. <laughs> nice work, Pat. <laughs> hey, Pat, you did a great job. Yeah, thank you, wow, Pat. thank yeah, you guys job, so much. Yeah, awesome. I mean, next time you should moderate. I mean, we do need to control the time a little bit better. We should have. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm pretty... Uh, please, we got a, almost a full hour and a half. Oh, no, that was amazing. I mean, well, we got a lot of Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I, I he seemed to be it. enjoying uh, himself more than when he was on the Bad Faith podcast. Dude, I noticed that too. I was like, he's <laughs> digging this more than any person. Like, you know, the podcast host. I proposed in the preview. Uh, I proposed in a previous meeting that we open with a like a fake trap question just to freak him out, but I didn't want to scare How him away. How have you been a class reductionist? <laughs> yeah. yeah something that'll make him groan and like, oh, this is what this is. Just like the most insufferable <laughs> lib question. I wanted to ask him, how many times on average does it take for you to spell bourgeoisie correct? <laughs> <laughs> bourgeoisie. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Great yeah, job, yeah. you guys. Great we we got good questions and i think you know i don't know i felt really gratified by you, what i you thought did. you kept it moving really really well you did great Pat. Thank right, you. Good. that was awesome thank yeah. you good. Yeah, thank thanks you for guys. putting it together all right until next time all right bye, bye. bye. See you next week